Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe learn something along the way. I'm your host, Isaac Levin. And if you're enjoying the conversations here, be sure to like, subscribe, follow wherever you're watching or listening. Also, if you or someone you know would like to come on the show and have a chat with me, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle there is Isaac R. Levin, or you can reach out to me on Mastodon. My handle there is Isaac R. Levin at Fossadon.org. All right, so with that out of the way, I'm looking forward to my conversation. I just saw them recently at MVP Summit, and we're just going to continue the conversation about great things in tech. So today, my guest is Martin Zickman. Martin, do you want to say hello, hello. to yourself? Hello, everybody. Hello, listeners. Hello, viewers, wherever you are. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to give a little intro as to who you are? Yeah. Um, so I'm a .NET developer, a Microsoft developer, technologies MVP, and I'm mainly focused on app development, and that's specifically cross-platform development. I started as a Windows developer, but then moved into cross-platform, and now I'm mostly focused on uh, contributing to open source a uh, project called Uno Platform, which mm-hmm. you can see on my T-shirt as well. Yeah, and it's uh, kind of my passion project. Uh, I'm uh, part of the core team of developers um, doing that uh, core framework, and I think we will talk about it also later. So I will explain more. Yeah, about it sure. As well. I, I, I want. I definitely want to get into the the stuff around Uno Platform because we were talking before we got started about you know the the, the interesting thing at least to me that Uno does that some other techs don't, and I'm looking forward to that. But I want to learn a bit more about you, right? And I think the best way for for me to learn is how you got started. So do you recall when the first time you engaged with technology, you know, you know, just for instance, like I've had people that got CDs in the mail and they wrote programs, they re- they typed code through a magazine. Other people are kind of more my age or maybe a bit younger and they started out building web stuff. Like when did technology first kind of introduce itself to you? Hmm. I guess we uh, at home got a computer quite early, sure. uh, like I was quite young when I was first using it and I got immediately like hooked on it because it's it was something very new, very interesting, very interactive. So sure. I kind of like the tinkering with it. I remember, you know, starting, uh, starting with uh, some simple games where I, you know, uh, tried uh, doing some, uh, you know, using uh, trainers that change the behavior of the game and things like oh, that. Okay. So that was kind of like uh, first kind of hacking thing, you know. But uh, then I wanted to learn about how those things actually are made. So I mm-hmm. started learning about programming. And I guess uh, I properly started programming uh, for real, like uh, actual programming language, not just uh, HTML, <laughs> uh, in um, high school where I started with uh, Pascal, I, I started learning Pascal. Back then, it was it was uh, quite a nice programming language. Sure. I think. <laughs> I'm sorry, but HTML is a programming language. I am not uh, yeah, going to. <laughs> I'm not going to die on this hill. But I, I, I mean, <laughs> if anybody has seen like crazy websites that people can put together, like there's definitely some oh, yeah. programming that goes into like, that. Like, uh, but back then, I guess it was. Sure. Yeah. Just, yeah. I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. time. Now it's more extreme. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's cool. So like Pascal, interesting. So like, so you've kind of been like in that world for a bit then, like for people who don't know, like a little bit of the backstory, like Pascal and then Turbo Pascal and then the, the person, Anders Halsberg, who wrote Turbo Pascal, eventually wrote C Sharp and so and so, so forth, oh, yeah. right? So like, were you, so like, were you like, at least from the, from the, the beginning, were you like very much, I can make a career out of this? Oh, I think so. I have. From the like, from the first time I wrote code, I uh, thought I sure. would love to do this for for a job because it was yeah. something super exciting where you can take a few lines of text and turn it into something interactive that does something for you more efficiently than you would be able to and stuff like that. So that's that's uh, probably the what got me excited about uh, about coding and i definitely knew that i want to do it and i'm happy that it ended up that way as well <laughs> yeah yeah sure i so I, i'm curious as to like you know what areas of technology interested you right like you like i think a lot of us I, um you know i think you and i are of a similar age i might be a little bit older than you but it's like the idea of like playing video games and like oh like i can like make games that sounds really cool um and then you realize like making video games is not fun I mean, not to not to knock and not to knock anybody that makes video games, but everybody that I know who has been a part of a like a, a game studio company, it's it's like it's a lot of work. 
Um, mm. So, like, what areas of technology were interesting to you at first? Like, obviously, like, getting hands-on with Pascal, like, that's pretty deep dive, right? Like, um, were there areas of technology that you're interested in specifically? Like, obviously, t- we talked about the web, but eventually it transitioned into something else, I'd imagine. Yeah, I, I, like, I did web for a while, but uh, I more liked the desktop applications or applications sure. uh, that are, you know, you install them and then you run them on, on the PC directly. So kind of yeah. the native technology. Uh, I, I always liked more than web. So yeah. I guess uh, also that that brought me into the app development space and the cross-platform application development that I'm doing now. But uh, on school, I remember that, you know, we, we started with uh, Pascal and then Delphi, it was, which was mm-hmm. also uh, the visual version of Pascal. And uh, we were doing, uh, well, well the, the teacher that was teaching us was very good. So he, he was uh, actually very experienced, not only with the, you know, normal application development, but also with the uh, mathematical background of it. So we, okay. he taught us algorithms and uh, he taught us well. So we uh, also participated on, on some uh, programming competition. So I was in the uh, Olympiad in uh, informatics. So I, I was even on the, like, then I even got to the international, like, round of it. So it was pretty exciting. Wait, so we have to hold on. So what was your project then? Like, if you, like, if you had some success, like, with the project, what was the project that you built? Oh, it wasn't uh, like a project. It was, it was uh, if you know, uh, mathematical Olympiad, yep. like, with maths. So there is a version of it with informatics. So it's based on algorithms. So you get, like, four assignments. Oh, okay. or tasks to do in like four hours or something like that. And you have to solve them in the most po- efficient way possible. Mm. So your program has to be like in a specific time complexity or sure. memory complexity. So that was uh, that was uh, the base of it. And I, I actually participated in the national round and then got also into the international version. So it was pretty interesting. And I enjoyed like that problem solving because it... You know, you start with something that's very complex and not efficient, and then you figure out some ways to, you know, uh, change the algorithm to solve the same problem in a more efficient way. And it was kind of fun for me. I, I uh, quite enjoyed that mathematical or analytical part of it as well. That's fascinating because you. it sounds like what you're describing is very much like, um, I don't know if this translates as well to, to where you live, but in the U.S., like there's this website called Leap Code where yeah. you know like that basically the whole thing is that like where it gives you programming assignments and you have to solve them in like the most efficient like logo notation way right mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. and uh, like a lot of people use it to prep for like job interviews so right. do you still do stuff like that do you still go on like those coding websites and like try to solve them and get like five stars or whatever the the gamification is like not that much. I uh, every year I do the advent of code uh, yep. event yep. that's in December, and uh, I am trying to finish up this uh, last year still. <laughs> I sure, still have sure. Like three three problems or something to to finish, and I publish videos on YouTube as well yep. as I'm solving those. So uh, I'm trying to kind of share the thought process of figuring out the solution to those problems as well because I think like it. Uh, Algorithmic part of programming is not as often is often overlooked. Like, sure, sure. Uh, I know that you know uh, job interviews are very focused on that specifically yeah, yeah. often, and that that doesn't make much much sense. But I think still it's useful to know those techniques and to understand how the time complexity matters mm-hmm. because that allows uh, developers to improve and develop uh, improve their code as well. So that's pr- quite valuable. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I have a love hate relationship with, with specifically like performance tuning for for applications, specifically because it seems like college universities they hyper focus on yeah. algorithms and things like that, and then like you mentioned, job interviews highly focus on like, hey, can you you know reverse this string in the fastest way possible, and you can't use like mm-hmm. the built in stuff, like you got to do weird things with memory allocation or whatever, right, and. My res- my pushback was always like if I needed to do so, I would just look it up, like right. I don't need to like know off the top of my head, and this kind of goes into an interesting thing because it's like now you're it could be in an editor and Copilot or whatever your editor of choice is like will 
recommend, like, I don't know, like, if you were to give a comment, like, what's the most performant way to do a, a search of, you know, an array for a particular value, right? It's more than likely going to give you, like, the most efficient one. So yeah. the question becomes is, like, you know, I don't want to say the algorithms aren't as important anymore because I definitely do, but I'd love to get your thoughts is, like, as we get closer to this world where you have basically Stack Overflow, all the entire internet, like, in your IDE with you, like... Mm -hmm. How important is it to know kind of like the, 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 in my opinion, kind of like the principles of computer science? Hmm. I, I guess uh, at least the basics are important yeah. because you need to, uh, because if you were, were not able to understand the time complexity of things, you wouldn't even know why uh, improving the efficiency is worth it. Or sure, you wouldn't fair. know that the, there is a problem that you should be solving or improving. So I guess uh, there is certain value to understanding the analytical side of things, even though like the tools, as you mentioned, uh, are able to help us uh, significantly right now. So it's, so it's, I guess, you know, uh, Copilot often gives you some interesting output, but you yeah. need to understand why yeah, that that's true. is the way it is. And if you don't understand it, it's possible that you will introduce some bug or, uh, you know, there will be some one-off issue that you will not be able to solve because you don't understand why that code is written in that way. So I guess, you know, Copilot is good, but you still need to be the pilot of the thing. No, I, I totally agree. And, I, and I, I wasn't looking for like, oh, Martin, like you said something ridiculous. I'm generally curious because, you know, when you talk to people that are like just got, getting started in tech, they have all these tools at their disposal to like kind of skip the line a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in depending what sort of technology you're building with, like, if you're, you know, a front end developer and you're using building React or Vue or Angular or whatever, right? Do you need to know, like, memory allocation? Do you need to know right. these sort of things? Like, the answer is maybe, but I think it's interesting that like, we're getting to the point where, a lot of the questions that we'll have, we have as developers, like, they're very quickly available to us, right? What, which is why I always think that like hey, job interview, asking somebody for like some random like program assignments, like, well, no one ever programs like with no access to the internet, right? Like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, even on a plane. So you mentioned, you know, the building client apps or like desktop apps, right? Do you remember like the first app you built that ran on Windows or ran on Mac OS or whatever? Hmm. I uh, don't remember the First one, like I guess the first, the bigger the, one, I guess. Yeah, I guess the first one that like you were proud of. Yeah, uh, uh, that was at the moment where we were discussing or learning about linked lists in uh, Delphi, or like sure, yeah, uh, in linked lists uh, as a you know way of building a uh, list-based information, and we were uh, tasked to build a kind of uh, user evidence application that uh, had a linked list of users and you were able to add users and uh, sort them and in order them and so on. So it was like yeah, quite a complex application and I enjoyed you know, tinkering with it and making more and more improvements and more and more features into it. So yeah, that was probably the first one that was uh, I'm actually proud of or I, I think that was very well built and what do you uh, think? for and what that do you moment. And what do you think it was about building like desktop apps specifically, right? Because I think, you know, at least during my time, like everything was like web, like web 2.0, like building things that like can run, like anybody can go to a website and do these things. But like when you're building client apps, like there's a lot of choices you have to make, especially probably when you got started, right? Like there wasn't a lot of tools that made like the ability to build cross platform, like soup, like probably there was stuff like Xamarin or Xamarin was, was coming shortly, right? Um, mm. but like the idea of like, oh, I need to like make a technology decision. And then if I want this to run on a different type of technology, I basically have to rewrite it. Mm. I guess uh, what I liked about, uh, native applications more than the web is that the web was kind of, you, uh, you present some information to the user, they click, and then, uh, the processing happens somewhere else and you get results back. And it didn't seem like uh, that real time to me. So, so I, I like more the fact that you have an application and everything is inside of it. So the yeah. client is yep. the app, and you are doing everything on the one location, and it's all real time, and it you can uh, 
uh, you have real time memory of what the user mm -hmm. has do, uh, done and what is uh, they are doing. So I think that's that's what I liked about it most. Plus, I was also a fan of Windows, so that made it more uh, like <laughs> interesting for me because you know when you make a button, it looks like a Windows yeah. button, not just yeah. like. A, you know, browser button. <laughs> sure. No, that, that's a good point. Like the idea. And plus, if you're built like there's something I can only speak as somebody who the first time I had an app that was like available in the Windows store, I very much was like, oh, like anybody can find like even people that don't care, like if they go to the Windows store to look for, I don't know, the Netflix app and like they can maybe oh, yeah. come across something I built. It's very, it, it, it definitely is one of those things where it makes you feel like, oh, man, like there's a lot of potential people that could be using this. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit like, you know, that's one thing, too, like the idea of like because I think when you when you talk about deploying like web apps, like deploying mm -hmm. web apps is pretty straightforward, right? Like you build it and then you publish it and then you just put it wherever it's going to run. Like deploying like desktop apps is a bit different. Like, do you remember like the first time that you had to like do like a, a more sophisticated like deployment of like a Windows app with maybe you're using click once or, or whatever, right? And you're just like, this is like not easy. Yeah, I guess, I guess it was uh, at the time of Windows Phone because I, you know, I started uh, the non-desktop app development with Windows Phone back then. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of incentives from Microsoft to build Windows sure. uh, Phone applications. UWP, right? Those was UWP? Uh, yeah, even before. Yeah. Even before, oh, before like, yeah. the Windows Phone 8 or yeah. Windows Phone 7.5 or something. And that was fun because Microsoft was kind of giving out phones to everybody yeah. who was building applications. So for students, there was a lot of competitions as well. Mm. So we were asked to build some useful applications, publish them on the store, and we were given a Lumia uh, phone for it. So it was pretty nice, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I, that's that's uh, probably the first time I did kind of the deployment to the Windows Phone store. And mm -hmm. that was kind of problematic at the time because it wasn't <laughs> sure. it wasn't stable, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. there were some issues with the publishing process. For example, in my place, I had quite slow network connection. So when I was trying to upload the, how was it, APPX, I don't know what was the sure. package name, uh, but when you uploaded it, it timed out during the upload. Oh, so yeah, because it's a couple hundred yeah. megabytes, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I had to do it from, from the school instead because that was, had a faster network connection. That There it works. So, yeah, it was uh, kind of complicated. Plus then you had to also prepare the marketing images and the proper sure, sure. description and so on. But, you know, it was also kind of you were you were exposed to the whole process of not just building the application but also promoting it and yeah. uh, making some noise about it so it was you know is, a good learning experience it is kind of interesting like regardless if you're like one developer like you or like a multinational corporation like the process is still the same to get an app into the stores right like it's it's yeah. th that in my opinion it's very interesting because i'm like let's just take you know the, the Windows Store, for example, right? Like, yeah, my app is going to sit next to, like, the, the iTunes or the quick iTunes of the world or whatever, right? But the process that I do to get my app there is probably substantially different up until a particular point, then it all has to be the same, right? It isn't... It, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, so, it, it's it, obviously, we talked about, like, building apps for Windows, but eventually, in order to kind of you know, get to more people, you just have to start building apps for other platforms. Like, when did you start kind of playing around the idea of like, okay, I love Windows, but there's more people out there that use things other than Windows? Hmm. I, I guess it was about the time of when Xamarin Forms came out, because yeah. when then uh, it was the first .NET and XAML-based uh, framework that also allowed you to target Android and iOS. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty interesting because I always worked on XAML-based applications for sure. WPF and then uh, Windows Phone and Windows 8. So I guess that was kind of natural progression. Even though yeah. the XAML was different, I still you know, was familiar with what it did. And that uh, brought me to... You know, I, I tried to uh, convert my existing applications to uh, Android and iOS. So yeah. that was probably the first cross-platform work that I did. Yeah, so you took a WPF app and you tr and you converted it to Xamarin Forms. Oh, it was uh, UWP. 
So, oh, yeah. Uh, how did, how did that... Maybe Windows 8. How did that, something. Yeah, how did that go? I'm curious. I would then well well it went <laughs> reasonably well, but sure, I sure. guess the the differences were there, you know. Uh the the control suite that's available to Xamarin that was available to Xamarin Forms at that time was much slimmer than what you have on Windows. So yeah. a lot of the controls that I wanted to use weren't there and you had to kind of work around it or uh, make some custom render to make them yeah. happen. So I guess that was kind of a struggle, but like it went reasonably well still. So like, so, and this is all like Microsoft stack, right? Like building things like, you know, WPF or UWP or Xamarin Forms. Did you ever experiment with like other platforms like I think of React Native or you know anything that uses like the Chrome engine like did you play around with anything in the, in those other technology stacks or were you very much like I like building XAML based applications using Microsoft technologies I'll just stick with it mm, I guess I guess it was mainly C Sharp and .NET yeah. overall because I liked the language and probably because I also liked Pascal it was kind of the same, uh, very similar, logical right? Logical to yeah, like yeah. C sharp, and I I never uh, kind of enjoyed the JavaScript world because it felt to me as the typing wasn't there, uh, mm. strong typing, and uh, you know it was kind of more funky <laughs> in a way that you could write the same thing in too many different ways. Yeah, and there was no, I think like C sharp has more guidelines or more, guardrails. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, pretty, pretty, like also the design patterns are more clear, I guess. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it is kind of interesting, right? Like, and and I, and this isn't a a knock on building JavaScript apps. Like, I I think that there's a, a place to build JavaScript apps, but like I think of it like I think a JavaScript app. I think of the web, and then mm -hmm. we start to get down this path, like with React Native and even like Node, right? Like you're building, you're building apps that don't run just in the web. Like, or mm -hmm. run, like, run, like, with a UI. And, like, to your point about, like, you can kind of do something, like, I, there's three rep, there's three main web frameworks. There's there's thousands of web frameworks, right? But, like, there's Vue, there's React, and there's Angular. All three of them do the same thing. Very opinionated, right? Like, you could probably make the same argument as, like, oh, well, Java and .NET are very similar. It's like, yeah, but, like, they're not. They don't use the same underlying language, right? Mm. Um, anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, like, and, you know, I, I agree as somebody who has, you know, gone and played around with other languages, I always end up coming back to C Sharp because I think that's where I, I'm most comfortable. Um, so, like, Xamarin Forms, right? Like, you're playing around Xamarin Forms and, you know, the technology shifts a bit. Like, when did you, like, when did you start paying attention to, like, you know, I you know .NET MAUI came out a few years ago. Like, when did you, like, were you a very early adopter of MAUI and playing around with it? Uh, not as much because at that Point of time, I was already working on Ulo, so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I actually, yeah, yeah. It was uh, for me the transition was from Xamarin Forms to Uno. Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like, when did you first, you know, just for disclosure, like Mark, like he contributes to this to the Uno platform, which we'll talk about in a bit. When did you first kind of become aware of it? Hmm. Uh, I think the point of time was when I was doing a lot of blog posts uh, yeah. about you know .NET development, Windows application mm -hmm. development, sure. and UWP and stuff like that. And there was uh, some kind of event where Zamarin was Zamarin uh, team was asking to uh, for people to write something about why people love Zamarin. Uh, mm. So I wanted to also participate, and I wrote a blog post where I mentioned several different reasons. And one of them was that Xamarin is the base for multiple different cross-platform frameworks sure. like Xamarin Forms and Uno Platform. And that was the point where I actually tried it for the first time. And I really liked it because it was Windows development, taking yeah. the Windows applications and bringing, bringing them to Android and iOS with the same UI as on Windows, which was yeah. pretty exciting. So I yeah, guess that, that was the start of it. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Were you were so were you an MVP at that time, or was this kind of was this before you were an MVP? Uh, before that, yeah. Okay, I wasn't yeah. yet. 
Yeah, it's like, and the reason why I ask is because like I, I see a lot of MVPs, and not to knock them, but like MVPs become very prolific, like with their opinions, and I think all of their opinions are great. Um, but I think one of the, the for folks who might not be aware of the Microsoft MVP program, like one of the one of the ways that you can get it is a kind of a community builder sort of a, uh, sort of nomination or award. Like you can write blog posts, you can speak at events, you can create content, you can build the community um, and kind of create that really direct correlation with Microsoft. Um, I like to talk, you know, before we kind of dive into Uno, I like to talk a little bit about the MVP program. Like, you know, what is the MVP program to you? I'm just generally curious as somebody who has, you know, been an MVP and has been. I, I think it's it's a great opportunity to be part of a uh, like-minded group of people who sure. are passionate about Microsoft technology and like to share things about it and also a great source of learning because they, those people are exposed to it all the time and uh, they definitely know what they are talking about so it's it's a also a great learning experience so i think that both like the potential to share more and you know get your uh, point of view or your your uh, learnings that you get from your daily work to more people, it also is a great way to get more opinions to you as well. Yeah. So it's kind of bi-directional. Yeah, like, and I, I'll say this, like the, you know, <clears throat> the the category that you're in, you know, the developer technologies category, we're very, very uh, lucky, right? Like everybody who's like, who works at Microsoft or is in the community around developer technologies, they're all amazing people. And for just for context, like, you know, last week, which was, you know, the you know, middle of middle of March in 2023 or 2024, like we had MVP Summit where we had like MVPs from all over the world come in and hang out with the product group from Microsoft. And I, I got to see Martin and say hello and I got to see some other folks from Roto Platform and it's always good. But like, it's like that community building thing, right? Where we're all together, we're all trying to like, what can we do to make this technology better? And, you know, the, the, the team at Microsoft is super interested in being accessible, which I think is, is, you know, different than maybe some other maybe uh, categories or even like some different community builder awards that exist for other technology companies. Yeah, I like that Microsoft is actually listening to their community of developers, which is something I don't see in other companies. Mm. For example, if I was a Apple developer, I don't think there would be any communication going on with the developers or, or the actual uh, product owners in Apple. Yeah, because they are so close, you know, they are not as open and Microsoft was uh, doing this before and now they sure. are like the biggest open source company as well. So that's super cool that they are actually uh, doing what they are uh, promising, that they are being more open and they are listening to, to the feedback and they uh, try to improve things based on the feedback they, they are getting. Of course, not always, like they killed Windows sure. Phone, which is always my... Uh, grudge <laughs> with Microsoft, but yeah, 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 definitely I, great. There can be a whole conversation about Windows Phone and, and what went wrong. <laughs> I mean, the phone was beautiful, like the Lumia phone, like, like still to this day, it is the best looking phone out there. And like oh, the yeah. UI, like the user interface for for Windows Phone, still in my opinion, the best UI. But developers didn't want to build for the platform and that's a whole conversation yeah. for a different day I don't, not not to say all developers because you mentioned yourself right but in them in masses developers in general but i think you mentioned open source and i'd like to kind of transition this to you know something i'm interested in learning more about right i so uno platform so i know a little bit but i don't know as much as i should can you just give me a refresher on what the uno platform is and like what value it provides in the dotnet ecosystem uh, Uno Platform is a solution for building beautiful .NET applications that run on all devices that you can imagine. So from phones on Android and iOS to desktops, that's Windows, Linux, and macOS, and also to the web, which is WebAssembly. So it uh, allows you to cover the whole range of all the different devices, even IoT devices. Mm. Uh, so you can you know, reach users where they are, and you can reach them with the whole productivity suite that uh, Uno Platform supports and offers. So it's kind of not just a framework itself, but it's a lot of productivity multipliers on top of it. So like uh, Figma integration and toolkit of uh, controls and uh, extensions that allow you to kind of build up applications more easily and so on. So it's, it's a whole suite of things 
and it's it's kind of exciting to be part of it. Yeah, like I'm going to I'm going to just call out one thing because as somebody with a marketing background, like use the phrase beautiful, right? Like mm-hmm. you know, when you think like most people in tech like they like one of the first words out of their mouth when they're describing some technology platform isn't beautiful, right? So like what to you makes Uno platform beautiful? I think the the ability to make it yours. The ability yeah. to style everything and theme everything to match your uh, needs, to match your company branding, to make it, you, you get control of every single pixel on the screen. And that's that's yeah. something that's quite unique. Like it's, uh, especially in the .NET ecosystem, you know, uh, in Xamarin Forms, when I was developing it, the limitation was that it was based on the native controls yeah. on each platform. So. If you had a button, it looked differently on each platform. Yeah. And if you wanted to brand it or like customize it to be more uh, matching your company branding, you would have to kind of uh, write some custom yeah. renders or reach into the platform specifics, which wasn't that easy because you had to yeah. learn about all of those things. So I think that's that's kind of the advantage that Uno platform has that it really gives you more control over the you over the over the, over the visuals. Yeah. And then you are more able to make your application look great. Yeah, it's a delicate balance, right? Because I think to your point earlier, like there is value in like, oh, my app that maybe is deployed to Apple, it looks like an Apple app. Oh, yeah. Uh, but deployed Definitely. to Android, it looks like an Android app. But like you, you do need some flexibility, right? Like you talked about branding. Maybe you, for, what, for whatever reason, you want the app to look the same on every platform, right? And the ability to be kind of had that slider bar of like customization from a UI standpoint is, is really important when we're building any kind of application, specifically apps that, you know, they run on phones, they run on web, they run on, you know, desktop apps, right? Like all those are different size screens and different um, like gestures and different touch points, right? So like it would make sense to like have a ton of customization and flexibility around how we're building what the UI looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So one thing that I'm, you know, as a, as a lay person, as it pertains to this, like I, I've been mostly a web developer. I built desktop apps, right? Like you mentioned, I, I built some WPF apps and I built some apps in Maui. Like, so, uh, you know, we don't have to directly compare Uno to those other platforms if we don't, if you don't want to, but I'm genuinely curious as to like, when you would choose Uno platform in particular scenarios or what Uno platform does that maybe, you know, it's a bit more challenging in other spaces. You mentioned the UI standpoint, right? But is there other things? Hmm. I guess the completeness of the offering is, is uh, yeah. one of the things that would be interesting because you, <clears throat> with, uh, with Maui, for example, you get uh, the XAML, you get some essentials, which are the yeah. like device, uh, connectors where you can reach yeah. out to the sensors and stuff like that. But it's still just the framework itself. Yeah. But Uno is a platform that not uh, it's not just the framework, but also the things on top of it. So I guess that's one of the reasons Uno might be more interesting in for, for a team of developers that want to get their applications mm-hmm. into the store faster, or I guess uh, be more productive developing the application. But... Yeah, for 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 me personally, uh, I like the fact, like the the reason why I started contributing to Uno was that uh, that was when I wrote that article about that included Uno as well, was the time where my when Microsoft killed Windows Phone actually, and uh, yeah. I was thinking how I could take my existing Windows Phone applications to the other platforms mm. most easily. And then uh, I saw that that Uno platform is doing exactly that. They are taking the same XAML code, the same full-featured, styled, and templatable uh, XAML, and taking it to the other mobile platforms. So I guess that that templatability and styling is kind of valuable to me, and and it has been uh, the reason why I preferred using this instead of the other alternatives. Yeah, I mean, I, I so from a technology standpoint, right? Like it's it's C sharp, it's on top of .NET. Like, do you want to maybe dive a little bit deeper into like, you know, how like what is built on top of and like how you actually get started as a developer building for Uno platform? Yeah, uh, like Uno platform. Uh, that's a co- common question. How it's uh, kind of made up? How the architecture sure, is sure. done? 
so one important thing is that Uno platform runs directly on top of .NET. So mm -hmm. it's .NET uh, talking to Uno platform, and on top of Uno platform is your application. So it's uh, it's uh, the middleware layer that kind of translates your .NET C# -sharp code to run uh, on top of .NET mobile bindings for Android and iOS, and then also on, on desktop for .NET 7 and 8, you know, for WPF and uh, Linux and so on. So it's it's uh, kind of giving you a cross, fully cross-platform layer uh, that you don't have to learn about any platform specifics. Okay. And all the APIs are working just uh, like magic on all the targets that you can imagine. So uh, that's a kind of uh, something I love about Uno is that we are figuring out the things that developers would have to figure out for yeah. themselves yeah. if they wouldn't uh, use Uno. So, you know, understanding, uh, like recently I was working on windowing uh, implementation. So how to abstract away the complexity of how Windows work on Windows yeah. and how on Linux and how on Mac OS and kind of abstract it away into something that's usable and you don't have to think about it. It just works. So that's that's pretty nice. Yeah, because I think one thing that's that you know, I think people know, but people don't really re recognize um, fully is like how different all these different platforms do things, right? Like if anybody has tried to, you know, there's again, Uno, Uno isn't the only platform that's doing like this sort of building cross platform apps, right? There's lots of frameworks that do this. Some are .NET, some are not .NET, and like the amount of effort that like the reason why these platforms is the amount of effort it takes to like write an app once and it does all the Android things, it does all the Windows things, it does all the other things, right? It's not trivial. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm always kind of struck with is like a de the deployment, right? Like even like how you deploy the apps is different depending on where you're going. I'd imagine Uno uses kind of the same constructs that exist that with .NET to get things like the Apple Store or the Android Store. Yeah, definitely. We have we are basically telling our users to follow the guides that yeah. are provided by Microsoft because those are the latest and greatest <laughs> and most up to date. Now, like, yeah, you, as you mentioned, like the packaging and getting those applications to the store is often uh, the second challenge that you have Quite faced different. With. Quite different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very much so, especially on iOS. I, I always struggled with those provisioning profiles and certificates and everything that's there. So, and the so fact that you have to pay money to do it, that's a, oh, yeah, as well. that's a whole <laughs> different conversation, right? Like you need to pay money to put things into the store, which I understand and, yeah. why, but also I don't understand why. Yeah, and they are also then taking cut from every single sale. So <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, Apple's got to make money. Not trying to bash Apple here. Apple's got to make money, though. They're really, sure, sure. They, they really need to make the money. Um, uh, so that's... You know, we talked about like building things for desktop, like Mac, Mac OS or Windows and the phone. But like you talked about like in the browser, right, with like WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating to me because I'm a I'm a web developer, right? But uh -huh. I've all like I've always seen examples of people trying like, oh, I have a desktop app. And I just want to have it run in the browser for whatever reason. Yeah. So Uno can help me with that. Yeah, I guess that's that's. Uh... One of our main advantages against, uh, I guess, Maui, for example, sure. because Maui is focused on mobile and desktop, yep. but there is no web story there. So yep. if you want to to bring it to uh, people uh, on the web, because web is the most ubiquitous uh, platform, because everybody has access to the web. Sure. Uh, everybody who has a screen has access to the web. And a browser runs even on uh, Fridge. It runs on... I don't know, uh, everywhere. in the car as well. It's, Terrifyingly it's just everywhere. everywhere, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It runs, in spa runs but, on spaceships, right? Exactly. So <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. And that, that, that means that you definitely want to have your application running there. So uh, WebAssembly is the way to do it. And when you take an Uno platform application and run it on WebAssembly, it's like magic. It's the whole business logic of your application running on the client directly in the browser yeah. and it's an actual native application in the way it uh, behaves in real time it's it's uh, running locally and if you go offline there is no uh, like cutoff you still can work and the application is fully featured so that's pretty beautiful 
Yeah, I, so I, I feel like the first time I saw an example of this was like NuGet, uh, the NuGet Package Explorer. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, as somebody who has been a Don developer, and NuGet Package Explorer has been super helpful for me, but it only runs on Windows, right? And I remember when it was announced that it like runs in the browser now. I, I, I reached out to the like the maintainer for it, and I asked her like, "Did you have to rewrite this?" And they're like, "No, no, it just it runs. It, it just it uses Uno. It just runs using WebAssembly." Like it, it, to me, that's like what you mentioned. It's absolutely magic. I don't want to know how it works as a developer. I'm I I am thankful that it works, but maybe just just very briefly from like a like say first of a WPF app. What would mm-hmm. I need to do to my WPF app to make it run with Uno platform in the browser, like at a high level? Okay, so if you are coming from WPF, you have to do a little bit of rewrite because <clears throat> Uno platform is based on the WinUI XAML, which is yeah, okay. kind of the more modern version of XAML. So there is some differences, some features that were in the WPF are not in WinUI and some which were, sure. uh, are, some are new and improved the experience. So you have to kind of rewrite a little bit the UI, but the naming of things is the same. So it's not that big of a deal. You can still use completely the business logic. So that's, that's completely fine as well. And, uh, yeah, I think that's that's about it. You kind of rewrite the UI a little bit and uh, kind of adjust your code behind to to match uh, what Vue is doing. But otherwise, it's it should be quite a seamless process of modernizing and bringing the same application to the web. And we have actually big clients that were doing just that, like uh, Kawa, which took their uh, complex, very complex project management software and they brought it from. WPF to the web, it's actually a super complex thing and it works beautifully. So uh, yeah, it allows you to build very complex web applications. And it's amazing actually what uh, web browsers can nowadays do. It's not just like a browser anymore, it's really connected to the system. So you have access to all the sensors like accelerometer and the GPS and even MIDI. I have a digital piano and I implemented uh, support for MIDI API in, in Uno platform. So you can connect your piano via, via USB to your PC and just play notes and it shows up on the PC on, and uh, you can also play notes from the application on the piano. So it's it's amazing. That's absolutely wild. So I'm going to just like, I'm just going to pause for a second. And like, so I, that sounds just abs- like you're saying like taking a, 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 a like an even a WPF app that might be old, right? Like it might, you know, maybe it's a WPF app. We did a lot of work to get it from .NET Framework to .NET Core, .NET 8 or whatever, .NET 7. Um, but like not like, and then we, okay, instead of having to build a web version, like you're saying, you just kind of maybe some make some subtle changes from the WPF based XAML to WinUI based XAML and change them back into APIs and it just works, right? That's substantially less work than building a web app from scratch, right? Like, yeah, definitely. Uh, so it's funny, like we've been talking about this and you've been talking about, that, you know, you, you, when you first started building stuff, you did HTML and front end and, and web stuff. And then you kind of had this interest in going to client stuff. But now we're talking about running apps in the browser, right? Yeah. So let me ask you this, right? You know, if you can think of like the one way to build apps, like, you know, using Uno platform, for example, like building apps that run on, Desktop, mobile, or in the browser? Which one do you maybe not enjoy? Which one do you feel most comfortable doing still? Hmm. I guess it's still the desktop side yeah. of things because they have the fastest dev loop because you yeah. are on the device that you mm-hmm. are debugging on. So that's the kind of the most natural way to develop. And I guess... Uh, because we are trying to abstract away all the platform specifics, our goal is kind of to give you the same experience than all the, on the other devices without you having to think about it. So uh, I always hate when I have to write any platform specific code because that means that we failed in uh, that specific part and I'm trying sure. to you know, implement the same API everywhere because that means that I don't have to think about it, it just yeah. works. So uh, I think that's that's uh, the main main goal I have, you know, writing the platform in a way that it runs the same everywhere and it abstracts away all the thinking that you would have to do. Yeah, no, I it's that's interesting. 
I, I think, you know, from my perspective is like I said, as somebody who builds web apps, like whenever I build like a client app, like I, I can do it, but it just feels sort of unnatural. And I think like mm-hmm. you're, you're talking about the, the flip side where it's like you feel more natural, like, you know, the ability to, if you're in Visual Studio or VS Code or Writer or whatever, and you just hit run and it just opens a desktop app, right? That's a, a better developer experience for you, which I think is awesome. I, I like, you know, I want to go down this path. We don't have to talk about it super briefly because it is kind of niche, right? But I think one of the, one of the things that, you know, we talked about a couple of different platforms, Windows and Mac and phones and the web. And, you know, there is another platform that not a lot of people talk about, right? Like building apps for like the desktop for Linux, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, tell me a little bit about how Uno solves that problem. We have, uh, well, uh, so two things. I guess we have a current, uh, our current solution is based on GTK, which Mm -hmm. is uh, another cross-platform framework, which abstracts away the Linux side of things. And uh, we are building or, or drawing our UI on top of it, yep. which means you can then run the application on Linux as well. And it even runs with um, WSL, so you can have Ubuntu installed on your yeah. Windows and then you run it there. So that's, uh, I guess, the first angle. And uh, for the second angle, I would uh, ask you to wait for next week because we are going to be announcing something that's going to be very interesting. So. All right. Yep. Well, so um, <laughs> how about this? So you you can give me like, a, so after you go live, let me know and I'll be sure to put a link to that post or that announcement that you're going to do in the show notes. So we're recording this middle of March, 2024. So if you're listening to this in the future, look at the show notes because there's probably something really exciting for you, which yeah, I don't know <laughs> anything about. So now I'm kind of excited. Now you've got me thrilled. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, like the Linux thing is funny to me because, like I mentioned, it's a very small user base, right? But it's so often overlooked. And you know, just for reference, um, you know, the last on the last episode of the show, I had Justin Garrison, who has been a a, a Linux sysadmin for a long time, and like he worked at you know Disney. And all the people at Disney like had Linux machines, like to do all the animations and things like that. So those applications had to be built for Linux, right? So like there's definitely people out there that are built that like need like really high functioning, high fidelity, really well built Linux app or apps that run on, on Linux, right? And it does seem like you always hear like, oh, not a lot of people use Linux, like from a desktop perspective. It's small, obviously compared to Windows and, and Mac OS. But I'd like to get your thoughts as like, you know, over the next few years. Like, what are some of plat- like if you look at the platform landscape, do you see any platforms like going down in in uh, usage or going up in usage over the next few years? Hmm. I guess when you talk about Linux, it's important to also include the IoT side of things. Sure. And there, Linux is significantly dominating the market. So I yes. guess if you omit Linux from the equation, then uh, you lose a lot of people who are using IoT devices mm-hmm. or you know any IoT device that has a screen can be your market as well. So yeah. I, I guess that's that's a very important to include them and that's a big market that uh, that you would be missing on. So that's uh, yeah. first thing. So I guess Linux is not going anyway uh, away so that there it's going to grow especially because of those IoT devices. So even though people will not maybe use it as much on desktop PCs, it's sure. still going to be a huge market and it's going to be growing. And I, I guess Windows, uh, Microsoft was not investing that much uh, over the last years maybe into Windows, but I guess it's ramping up now again thanks to the AI yeah. wave and they are trying to integrate Copilot into the system as well. So I guess that's uh, it's it's something that will rejuvenate the kind of yeah. excitement for people for Windows. So yeah. I, I guess all the platforms are healthy very much. Yeah, so. I, I totally agree. And I think that, it, you know, you, you look at the, the main platforms, right? I, I'll just take the big four, right? Apple, Android, Mac, like iOS, Android, Mac OS, and Windows, right? Like mm-hmm. there's a very specific user for each of those platforms, right? Exactly. And like there's going to be people that might hop around or use both or whatever, but for the most part... People who need Windows will use Windows. People who 
prefer Mac, we'll use Mac and so on and so forth, right? Um, it's very curious to me, like, you know, as somebody who has to care about all these platforms, like, and you can't choose Windows because you've already said Windows is like your favorite. Like, mm -hmm. what's your favorite platform other than Windows? Hmm. That's a very tough question. <laughs> well, I took Windows uh, out of it because it would have been too easy, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, hmm. I would say, actually, that um, WebAssembly would be my second favorite, oh. I guess. Oh, very because, good. Yeah, it's it's the most ubiquitous one. And it's super exciting because it's it's very new, but super capable. So I guess yeah. WebAssembly would be my second pick. Uh, because yeah, of course I'm I'm using uh, Android and you know, uh, I I'm I, I'm user of all those systems yeah. because I need to develop for them as well. Yeah. But WebAssembly runs on all of them, so mm -hmm. I think that's that's the second most exciting one for me. I I would agree. I think so. You know, when WebAssembly was first announced, I didn't understand it. I still really don't understand it. But then you see like demos of like people running like 30 year old C++ apps in the browser or, you know, running crazy like .NET Doom. apps in the browser. Yeah, Doom in the browser, Windows XP in the browser. Like, oh, yeah. it's like so I, I see that and I'm like, why? Why do we need this? But yes, we need this, right? So this is one of those things. Um, it What's also interesting, like, you know, to kind of pivot back to like Uno for a bit for a second is like you mentioned about having to like when you build things for all these platforms, like what is the local debugging story like? So like, do you have to have a, a MacBook? Do you have to have an Android phone? Do you have to have an iOS phone? Are the emulators that are built into some of the tooling work pretty well, not so well? Uh, I think uh, you are not required to have yeah. actually, no. Oh. So for, for, for Mac OS debugging specifically, you need a Mac. Uh, yeah. to have a Mac uh, available. Yeah, for you need, all the other you need, you need uh, you... what is it called, Xtools or, yeah. Uh, yeah, Xcode. Xcode, Xcode you need Xcode, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of uh, space on the hard drive as well. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> because Xcode is huge. Anyways, uh, you, uh, for, for that, you need Mac OS, but for all the other platforms, you are okay if you just have Windows PC because you can develop all of the other ones, including iOS with the hot restart, feature in Visual Studio, you can uh, develop all of them just on Windows. But of course, like the, the best experience if, if you have Windows and also the Mac, so you can you know, directly um, develop or debug those iOS and Mac OS de uh, applications on Mac or on an iOS device. You know, having the native device was yeah. always more uh, fun for me because when you see the application running on a sure. device, it's kind of different when you, than when you uh, see it in a simulator or emulator. It's just yeah. you have it in your hand, which is less less surprises cool. too, right? Like I think one of the worst things we could experience as a developer is like it works on my machine, and then like you you know it runs on somebody's phone in a different part of the world, mm. and they're like, oh, this button doesn't work if I click it, right? right like right. you know, so the ability to like test in with the native device is really valuable. Um, you know, I, I'm curious. Like so, obviously, you know, with your background you you know, you build predominantly on windows have you ever had to like build like use like a mac or a linux based machine as like your primary development machine before not as primary one yeah just a secondary option like we did learn about linux and all those uh, command line tools in, yeah. uh, in universities so that was my experience with unix i i think i prefer ui tools <laughs> as compared sure, to command sure. line but uh, yeah, it's very interesting that you can automate things very efficiently this way. And uh, it's super powerful when you know about it and you know how to use those tools. But yeah, I guess I always used uh, Mac OS and Linux as just secondary devices. Yeah. And I prefer the, the Windows experience for development because it's just so integrated with everything. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, I've noticed that more and more with the kind of stuff that I've been building, that I have to be in WSL way more, which mm -hmm. is great because WSL is like, it gives me all of this rich functionality that I would need another machine for. But like, yeah. 
I, I, I catch myself all the time having to like Google like bash commands, like all the time. Right. And I'm, and I, I sometimes I'm, I, I just feel like I missed out on this because you talk to some people that maybe are a bit older than us and they know like Unix commands, like all, all backwards and forwards. And, you know, I, I, like, oh, what's the syntax for like grep? I don't have no idea. So I have to look it up. Or how do I find a file the most efficient way? Okay, this thing. Like, and, you know, in like you mentioned, like with UI based systems, these things you don't have to worry about at all. Um, mm. But, you know, they're far more efficient if you do it via the command line, right? It's, it's, it's definitely yeah, you're fast. you're missing out, basically. Yeah, if you don't know it, you're missing out yeah. on a lot of productivity that you could have otherwise. Yeah, it just it's funny because lately, like, I just feel like my machine is Windows, but then I have a terminal open at all times, and it's in WSL. And I just, right. I, sometimes I think, like, Am I doing this the right way? Is there some other way to be doing this? Um, but obviously, WSL makes my life uh, so much better. Yeah, I just wish that Microsoft had also some WSM for no, no <laughs> WM, you know, for for macOS. You know, yeah, uh, Windows subsystem for for macOS, and you would be able to run all those uh, yeah. platforms in one single place. Yeah, I, I think I think Apple might have some issue with that. Um, I guess so. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. But there, yeah, but there was uh, there was dub, uh, Windows systems for Android, which uh, they just announced like they're kind of discontinuing. I'd assume it's because there's something with Google that their Google is building or whatever, right? Mm, that yeah, because I know like you can run Google apps on Windows now. Like uh, I can't remember what it's called. Like you can like there's some game. There's like a hundred games that you can get off of the Google Play Store that will run on Windows now. I imagine that's just gonna keep on adding to that. So Windows yeah. Subsystem for Android might not make as much sense. Um, this has been a great conversation. So, you know, just for time check, we're, we're about to wrap up. And I'd like to kind of, you know, as we finish this conversation, you know, we, we've talked about a lot. So we talked about kind of your, your career and you're getting started in tech and, you know, transitioning all the way to like building desktop apps that run in the browser and do all these crazy things. Like if you can kind of take a step back and think about, you know, what tech means to you. And you only had like one or two words to to kind of explain how you felt. What would they be for you? Hmm. I would say creativity and learning. Yeah. Yeah, because you always learn something new every single day, and yeah. there are so many uh, great people to learn from. It's just amazing, you know, the the breadth of knowledge that's there. And uh, even like even just in part of the team which in which I am, you know, every single person is proficient and uh, expert in some specific area, and it's amazing to see how they make things happen. And you always uh, are learning from them every single day. So that's uh, super great. And yeah. creativity, I think, for you know, creativity of everyday things, you know, creating something that is just code and then create some some pixels on the screen that's amazing as well no i i can't agree more i i'm always completely uh surprised whenever i whenever i'm having a conversation with somebody and that person says something and i'm like i did not ever think about that because yeah. i think one of the great things about tech is we all have different backgrounds and with that different backgrounds we have different thoughts on things so we can bring them into how to solve problems which i think is the beauty of all of us kind of working together um this has been great. I, so, you know, if you, for folks that aren't following, you know, Martin on social medias, you know, you can find him uh, on Twitter, uh, Zickman Dev. that's M-Z-I-K-M-U-N-D-D-E-V. Um, there'll also be some links to some other places that you can find him in the show notes. Also check out uh, Uno Platform, which is platform.uno, um, and there'll be a link to that as well. You know, before we sign off, my friend, do you have any parting words? Yeah, Thank you very much for having me. It was a great conversation and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I did too. This has been great. I, I hope folks um, try to think of different ways to build interesting apps, you know, because obviously we talked about all the different ways you can do it. So I'm excited to see what other folks are building in this space. Um, this has been, you know, for folks that are tuning in live, thank you so much. For the folks that are listening in the future, thank you as well. Hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. This is Isaac Levin from Coffee and Open Source and I hope you enjoy. Take care.